when we talk about prices, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I was trained in economics, in economics 101, what do you learn? Supply and demand. So I'm going to talk about the supply, or the inflow of grain into the system. I'm going to talk about the demand part, which is the outflow. So let's talk about the inflow first. Every year we look at how much grain do we have available, how much barley do we have available within the system. There's three sources. There's three different ways, major ways we get grain. Number one is production. Usually we spend all of our time talking about production. How many bushels are going to be produced this year? We have two other sources when we look at total available supplies. Okay, so what I tried to do here was show you, oh, let me back up, I hit the wrong button. This top line up here is total available supply. The middle line right there is the production, annual production. Okay, this little tiny one on the bottom, the black one on the bottom, is imports. Okay, so the three, three sources we have production, imports, and what? Carryover. Carryover. Exactly. So let's look at how relative size of it. How important are those three factors? And one of the things I always get comments about, and people misunderstand, is I hear it once in a while, it's like, oh man, you know, there's a lot of product and barley and spring wheat and durum coming across from Canada. Right? Because they see the trucks going across. And sure there is. There's always been product flowing across. But in the world of barley, that is total barley imports, including both malt and feed. And when you get out to the closer to PMW, there's some feed barley that comes across the line and go into the dairies in Idaho or Washington. So how big are the imports of barley into the US? How big a factor is that? Guys, it's rounding error. It is literally rounding error. So the two major sources are what happens domestically. How many, how many bushels do we produce? How much do we have left in the bin from last year? So let's just, of the production, let's forget about the inventories for just a little bit. When we look at production versus consumption, let's look at the balance. So the blue line on top is total use. The green line on the bottom right here, the, the bottom one, is actually production. Notice that production and usage tend to follow coming each other pretty closely, don't they? Now obviously you can't consume it unless you produce it, right? But then on the flip side, you're not going to produce it unless somebody's willing to buy it. So depending upon the time of year, we're either focused on how many bushels are we going to produce, or how much are we going to, how fast are we consuming it? What phase are we in right now today? <laughs> we'll be in consumption in about an hour, right? We're really looking, worried about production. Real big uncertainty right now is how many bushels are we going to produce? So let's, let's flip now to the consumption side. Now, I'll come back to the production in just a minute. Let me look at, look at the changes that have gone on in consumption. Now, I'm using USDA data. I know some of you are saying, oh, USDA you know, We can argue about whether it's accurate or not later. But just right now, just say, you know, I think they're pretty close. They may not have the exact number, but they're going to be pretty close. So USDA divides the use of barley up into four different buckets, four big different categories. Okay, the one on top, this blue one right here, is feed, the feed pile. Well, technically it's feed residual. But let's just call it the feed pile. The black line right there, this one right here in the middle, is exports. We got seed usage, which is down towards the bottom. And in the middle, you have the food, alcohol, and industrial use. So they're lumping kind of a bunch of things into that. Most of that, the vast majority of that, is for malt. Not 100%, but a lot. So beginning in 1980 and running through 2016, what do you see as the trends? Let me go back one. We know that the trend in both production and consumption of barley in the U.S. has been going down. So if we're consuming less barley, what are we using less? Of? How, how is that consumption? How is that? Who's using less? 
Okay. Well, looking at that graph, who's consuming less? Who has had the biggest reduction in use? What bucket? What category? Feed. So as, as acreage of barley has dropped, feed usage has dropped. What's the other big change that we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years? 35 years. Exports. Now, in the exports bucket, most of the exports, not 100%, but a large portion of the exports were also feed. Why have we seen such a dramatic shift or reduction in feed barley usage? Corn. Feed, when I talk to the livestock guys, when I talk to the nutritionists, they say barley is a great feed. It works really well. So why is everybody using corn? Pardon? Availability. It's simple to use. It's everywhere in the U.S. Why don't Canadians feed, feed corn? Why are they still feeding barley? They can't grow corn very well. Okay? The U.S. can grow corn really well. We do a good job of it. It's just too easy to access and feed corn. It's not that barley doesn't make a good feed. It's just too accessible. All right. So as the corn supplies have grown, it's basically pushed the feed, the barley, out of the feed market, right? So, what's left? What today, if you look at 2016, what's the primary use for barley? Alcohol! <laughs> the fun stuff, right? So let's talk about the dynamics. Why is that important? Why does that change the dynamics of the market? There's two big things going on. Let me go back. Oop, let me go back. Number one, in the mid-1980s, when it kind of peaked out here in the 80s on this graph, we had about 600 million bushels of grain. And that was all flowing through the system, right? There was a lot of different elevators that handled barley. There was a lot of different buyers for barley. Fast forward to today, what do we have for production? About 200 million bushels. There's less bushels flowing through the system, right? So there's fewer people dealing with it, and those that are dealing with it are specializing. Okay? Now let's come back to the usage. Back here, in the 80s, the mid-80s, lots of feed usage. Malt was an important, well, the maltsters were an important part of the market, but they were relatively small compared to feed and exports, the feed side. Okay? How much contracting, how much forward contracting was there, was there in the mid-80s? All right, you guys with the gray hair, I'm leaning on you. Not much. Most of it was spot market. You grew it, you didn't forward contract, you grew it, you tried to figure out what to do later. Well, A, there was a lot of bushels floating around, and B, most of it was for feed anyway. You could do that. Fast forward to today. How much forward, with the exception of 2016, how much forward contracting is done in the malting industry or in the, in the barley industry? The vast majority of it. Okay, so how big is that spot market? Small, because now we're look, A, we're using a third less bushels. So instead of 600 million now, we're down to 200 million and B, we now have a large portion of that that's contracted, not spot market. Okay, so when you look at the elevator price, and you're trying to figure out what do I do with my overrun, how many bushels are actually circulating in that pool? Not a lot. Not a lot. Now, let's talk, to, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to 2016, what I can see happening in just a little bit. I want to take you through this table real quick. These are the numbers behind that. I just want to point out a couple things, some changes that we learned just recently. So this is the supply demand balance sheet. This is USDA numbers. Just really quick, the top half of this table talks about the inflows, those total supply part. The bottom half talks about the usage numbers. And now I'm going to finally get to this carryover stocks, how much we're going to have left over. Okay. On the column side, this is the current marketing year. This is the crop that's in the, in the field right now. So the marketing year for barley starts on June 1. So we just started taking, keeping track of what's happening for the 2016-17 marketing year. 
So this is the current year we're in. This is the, the stuff that's in the field. This is the stuff that's in the bin, last year's numbers, and that's two years ago, just for reference. So let's look at real quick. What's happened to planted acreage? Planted acreage for barley has been relatively flat. Now we did get it, this was a forecast from the earlier numbers that was based off of an earlier survey. There was a survey that was released last week that said, you know what, we did get quite as much barley plant as we thought. Pretty close to what we were expecting to see. We did change again, both planted and harvested acres will drop just a little bit. So here's where I got it, audience participation. Let me ask you, how big a crop is this gonna be? The acreage numbers are down just a little bit from what we thought we were gonna be. This is the national average yield. That's based off a of trend line, it's based off a of history, kind of a historical average. Okay, now what's the reality? What's happening in the fields? Based on the current forecast, you know, last year's was a little bit below average. This year would be, you know, again, we're forecasting average. Are we gonna have an above average crop? A below average crop? Or about what we expect? What do you guys think? What do you, you're, you're the reps, guys. You're from all over the country, all over the state. It's gonna be below average. It's gonna be below average. So you think that number is a little bit high. Okay, hold that thought for just a minute, because I'm gonna come back to it. Okay. <laughs> then you can concentrate. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, so if we do the math, if we do the math, on, okay, the, if we take the average yield times that, that number, which is harvested acreage, we get about a 10% cut in total production. So based on, from relative to last year, we're gonna have about 10% lower bushels. But if you adjust for these new numbers we just got a couple days ago, we're actually looking at probably closer to 15% cut in production from last year. And again, a lot of that was came in, in the acreage, just the number of acres planted. So who are the major states that produce this? Idaho, Montana, North Dakota. So the North Dakota is this red line right here. Uh, Idaho is this purple one. And Montana is the green one. Now I did list Colorado, Washington, and Minnesota on there as well, but those are much smaller. Of those three states, now this is total bushels, this is total production, of those three states, which one is the most volatile? Which one has the most variability in production? Us. Why? Wrong. Planted acreage. Our yields aren't any more or worse, any more or less variable than anybody else's are. Our average is a little bit different, but as far as variability, we're about the same as everybody else. But our acreage keeps flipping. So when the industry needs more acres, where do they go? When they don't need as many acres, where do they go? <laughs> Why do they go here? Exactly, because we have so many different alternatives. We have so many different other choices in our mix. Okay. So let me come back to this. Now this is last year's numbers. This is the 2015 numbers. Our acreage went down this year. So when you, can, when you look at our planted acreage this year versus last year, last year 1.1 million, we're about 750 is what the last report said. Idaho is flat, they have the exact same number of acres. Montana went uh, down just a little bit. They're about 930, 930 million, uh, yeah, 930 million acres versus 970 last year. So, let me come back to that national average yield number. Our yields here in North Dakota look like they're gonna be a, a bit lower than last year. What about these other places? What about Idaho and Montana? It's irrigated, Idaho doesn't change, exactly. How about Montana? More like us. It's not as inconsistent. They have some dry land and some irrigated, so they that helps stabilize things out with irrigation. Pardon it? Yeah, so here's so the Idaho number is this is this year's number, that's last year's number, exactly the same. 
I don't remember. It is important. I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I got the report in the car. I couldn't it. What, what Doyle is asking is, we just we got a new report last week because um, they USDA did a survey in March saying farmers, what do you think you're going to plant? And then in, in uh, June they gave you, they gave you another survey and said, well, what did you actually plant? And Doyle's question was, in North Dakota, that 750 was actually, I think, an 8 or an 850 before. We didn't plant as many acres of barley as we thought we were in March. And his question was, did Montana shift their acres as well? I don't remember. I, I don't remember the numbers well. Okay, so here's, here's one of my comments. This is one of the biggest problems I see. And I, I'm not trying to be critical. It's just, it's, it's, it's human nature. We have the backdoor syndrome. When we think about marketing, and you're trying to make marketing decisions, you've got to think like a marketer. You can't think like a producer. Now, your job is to produce stuff. And we spent all day talking about production issues. And I get that. That's important. If you don't produce it, you can't sell it. Your job is to produce stuff. I get that. But if you try and market like a producer, you're going to make mistakes. If you try and market like a marketer, you'll do a better job. You're still going to make mistakes, but hopefully not as many. So one of the things that we got to get over is what, what people call the backyard syndrome. If I'm having problems, everybody else in the nation has to have problems. Or if the North Dakota barley crop isn't going to be as big as what we thought, that means the prices got to go up. Not necessarily, because we're only one piece of the puzzle. Okay? I want to come back to this. Now, so let's move forward. We know how many acres we planted. We're still arguing about the, the quantity, the amount of bushels, and the quality. Let's talk about usage. So one of the things that USDA has to do is forecast usage. How much are we going to use this year relative to what we've done in the past? And this is important because if we're looking for some kind of spark in the market, a spark in the market usually comes from some kind of surprise. Something happens we don't expect. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a question. If you have to forecast usage for barley for next year, would that be really difficult? Let's go through these one at a time. Look at the green line. That's the food, seed, and industrial use, i.e. malting. If you had to forecast a number for next year, could you do that? <laughs> Take last year's number and move it over, right? Okay, how about feed usage? Yeah, we well, can come pretty close. All right, how about exports? Something close to zero. How about seed usage? Well, seed usage just doesn't change. So let me rephrase that. Do we expect to see some big surprise in the market from the demand side in the next 12 months? The only possible surprise, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, might be, and this is a big maybe, this black line going up a little blip. A little blip. A little blip, yeah. So let's look at the numbers. Again, these are the USDA forecasts. Obviously, the, 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 that food seed in the industrial area is rel in total is relatively flat. Now, I know Paul and Rich talked about some of the changes going on within the industry. There's shifting going on within the industry. The adjunct brewers are becoming more efficient in using less malt, but then we've got the craft guys coming in that are using a whole bunch of more malt, and they're bumping out some of the, the adjunct when it comes to market share. But at the end of the day, it doesn't look like we're really using a whole lot more barley in total. The type of barley we're using is shifting, but the total bushels may not be. Okay. Will that change as we move forward? Ten years from now, are we going to be talking about the same thing? Can we use the same number ten years from now? <laughs> yeah, for 30 years. Okay, so what are some of the things, and this is really long-term stuff, I'm going to point at Rich and Paul for this. What might be an open door that we could walk through for more far usage? The malt industry is predicting increased need of their expanding capacity. 
They're expanding it. Oh, yeah, the malt industry is starting to expand capacity. Why are they expanding capacity? Because of craft brewers. The other part, and you mentioned it before, Paul, there is talk, and this is all talk at this point, it's speculation, but will there be able to will we be able to start selling into that Chinese market? And if that starts happening, all bets are off. Because that as you said, that market is so huge. You know, is that a possibility? We don't know. That's a speculation. I know, I know, I know, but it takes time. Okay. Feed market. And I'll be honest with you, I think the, the feed number will be, uh, it's probably pretty close. Again, very, very flat. Exports, the biggest hurdle we have in exports, again, primarily for feed barley, will be the Black Sea. The Black Sea, in particular, in Ukraine, produces a lot of barley, a lot of feed barley. They sell it really, really cheap. It's just getting really hard to compete with those guys. So at the bottom line, if all these numbers are correct, we're looking at a small cutback in carryover stock. So if these forecasts are right, if we have kind of an average yield nationally, we have typical consumption, because we have lower acreage, we're going to take our carryover stocks down a little bit next year. What does that mean? Drink more beer. <laughs> I like that. Let me come back to what was unique about 2016. What happened in the spring of this spring that didn't happen, that was, that was a shift from previously? Acres is down, but that's not the lowest acres we've seen. What was, what was another little shift? Because our carryover stocks, we had a really good year last year. We had good acreage, we had really good yields, and the quality was fantastic. Everybody was very, very pleased with the call. But what was the response this spring from the malting companies? Less. Less acres and very few contracts. Which means what for this year? What does it mean for you guys? Less carry Well, hopefully there's less carry We get our production, start to bring our production down again. But how many bushels are going to be in that spot market versus the contract market? Less than 2014? No. They've got a good supply, but what I'm saying is there's less barley acres or bushels contracted this spring, which means there should be more in the spot market. So you guys are going to have a little harder time trying to figure out when do we market and how long do we store our barley, because you got more bushel loads that are not priced. Right? True. And, okay, so Doyle's comment was we have a hard time finding 750,000 acres, the number from North Dakota. And I agree with you. Now, one of the things, and I want to caution everybody, when we talk about corn, soybeans, and wheat, the USD numbers, I think, are pretty solid. When we start to get to some of these smaller market crops, the numbers get a little fuzzy. Because they're taking surveys, and they're taking the survey responses, and multiplying them up to try and get a total. Because they can't talk to everybody. It's too expensive. So when you take a sample of a smaller number and multiply it up, your error can get bigger. So you could be off by... 50, 50 million acres for you. It would be a 7 instead of a 750. And that would make a big difference. Right. So let me ask you the next question. We haven't talked about quality yet. Of that, oops, we'll put that back up. Of that number, how much of that's going to be actually good multi quality? Yet to be determined, right? We don't know. We'll figure that out in about three weeks. <laughs> At least, kind of average is about 70% low quality. Yep, it was, it was higher than that. Yep. Acceptance rates, yeah, they've been, what, 90%, 85, 90% the last couple of years. We've had, we've had really good quality, it's been fantastic. Everybody's loved it. Abandoned acres 
Is he up? Did they? That's possible, so that's... So the spread between the planted and harvested acreage might change. Okay, so let's keep going. I'm getting there. I'm almost done. So when we look back historically, I'll, I'll, another, whoops, another way of looking at this, hang on, I'm hitting the wrong button all the time. Steve's little pointer thing is driving me nuts. It's backwards, yeah. Um, okay, so if you think about carryover stocks as a percent, so instead of just counting bushels, we think about what percent of our total usage are we gonna have in storage or reserve at the end of the year? So what, what's percentage-wise, what's the buffer? Well, if you do percentage, last couple of years, we've been at 40% plus. That's a pretty good inventory, isn't it? So if you're a buyer, right now today, if you're a buyer of malt barley, if you're a malster looking for really high quality malt, are you worried about where your next bushel's coming from? No. Uh, I'm gonna skip over this. So given what I just showed you, are you all excited about potential rallies in the barley market? No. They just want to I know they do, and I'm trying to help them with that. So if you look at, here's the point guys, if you look just at barley alone, you can get pretty depressed, and I get that. Actually, if it was barley all by itself, the barley market would be relatively stable. Now, stable markets can be good, because at least you know what to expect. Because one of the things that I've talked to farmers about some of these other crops, like soybeans in particular, is driving them nuts. Because yeah, it can be up you know, 30 cents, 40 cents, 50 cents in a day, but all of a sudden, two days later, it's you know, down 60. And volatility is nice in the respect that it provides opportunities, but it drives you nuts because you never hit the top, right? So the advantage of stable prices is it makes it easier to market, right? So is there something within the barley industry today that we can see, look into the horizon and say, well, what would be a shock factor? And I'll tell you, I'm having a hard time coming up with something. So if it's barley only, we would look at prices that would be relatively stable and near the point prices we have today, which nobody really likes. So let's look at the uh, impact of the other crops. Barley does not operate in a vacuum. It, does, it is connected to and related to other crops. Now this is a common question I also get. So which ones do we follow? If we're going to try and follow another crop as a proxy, we say, well, if we get a rally in X, will that pull barley with it? Which crop do we start looking at? Okay, so let's talk about that real quick. I ran, I actually ran the numbers on this. So the question, the question was, what do you follow? I'm going to get to the answer in a second. Hey, hold on your shorts, the bathroom will be there. I know. Okay, so what I did was, oops, wrong one. I look back historically, I got some daily cash prices from uh, an elevator in, it's actually Cheyenne elevator in, in North Dakota. Yeah, I did, because they have, they, keep, they report daily prices. They are very diligent about posting a price every day. I know they burned out, I saw it. I saw it, and it broke my heart. <laughs> like, oh man, now I'm not gonna get prices. But I looked at the price for malt barley in Cheyenne as a, as a kind of a reference point relative to the futures market prices for other crops. Okay, and says, so how sensitive, if, if we suddenly see a rally in spring wheat, does that mean that we can make any comments about what might happen in barley? Okay, so the first one I did was between Chicago wheat and cash mold price. So I looked at Chicago futures and local cash prices. And I know in the contracting world, there's one company that uses Chicago Futures as a reference point for setting their contract price. But that's for the contract price. That's not for the overrun. Why are they using wheat to try and price the contract? What's that? It's what you made. 
So if they're trying to be competitive with, they know that if they need to buy acres, you've got to be competitive with more than likely wheat. That's the obvious, that's the obvious one. Sometimes we can argue about other crops, but that's the one they chose. But for the crop that's already produced, not the crop, not, they're not trying to buy acres. This is the stuff we've already produced. What's the relationship? Well, I get a scattergram. So on the bottom, this is the price of barley, cash barley. And on the side, that's the price of uh, futures price for Chicago soybean, or for Chicago, excuse me, Chicago wheat. Now, mathematically, what we do is we, we can't calculate a correlation coefficient. It's just a number to say how closely related are these. A one means they're perfectly related. A zero means there's no relation at all. So this is at a, about a 0.35, which is pretty loosey-goosey. The translation is, if you see something happening in Chicago wheat, don't expect much to happen in barley. Oh, what about spring wheat? So let's, I did the same thing with Minneapolis spring wheat. So there's Chicago. Oh, oh darn this. There's Chicago, there's Minneapolis. It's a little bit better. Our correlation went up to 0.58. It so went from 0.35 to 0.58. So, you know, it's about a 50-50 mix. There is some impact, there's some spillover, but it's not really big. Okay. Next one, corn. Do the same thing. So, local cash price for bar malt barley versus corn futures. Now, all of a sudden, we get 0.68. They usually say by the time you get to 0.7, the relationships are getting strong enough to really start paying attention. Okay? So the translation of that is what? If we get a great big rally in spring wheat, would you expect price, uh, barley prices to change much? Not much. They'll probably get lifted some, but not a lot. If we see a rally in corn, if something happens in the corn market and all of a sudden goes ballistic, will that pull barley with it? Yes, feed barley. But that spills over into malting barley. Because the malsters don't want their barley, their nice, perfect malt barley, to end up in a feed bin someplace, right? So they're still through the feed market, even though there's very little feed barley used. There is barley out there, and it can be used for feed. We saw that in 2012, didn't we? The only reason malt barley went up as crazy as it is, because it Corn pulled everything out with it. And the molsters had to keep prices high enough to prevent their nice high quality malt barley from ending up in a feed bin. Now that was when corn was seven dollars. What about when, when corn's three bucks? Did they have to work real hard to get that barley out of the feed bin? Nope. <laughs> so all I'm getting at is, these are the last charts. This is the ugly stuff. This is what's happened, to, and actually corn went down again today. There's wheat. Wheat actually was flat. More optimistic stuff. Guys, here's my point. Let's go back to corn. I know that looks ugly, and everybody's got a big pit in their stomach right now trying to figure out, oh God, what do we do? Now hopefully you sold something up here. Probably not as much as you wish you would have. Because wheat, Kind of the same thing. We had, we had a nice little, even though it wasn't as good as we wanted, it's a lot better than today. So here's the guy. Don't panic. Part of my story today is don't panic. We are in the middle of the summer. Prices are also extremely volatile in the summer. We still have a lot of growing season left. Now, the window of growing season is starting to shorten, obviously. But when is the key reproductive stages for corn and soybeans in the corn belt? What months does that happen? Late July and in August. Late July being flowering for corn, and then August for corn fill and for soybean pollination. So the moral is watch the weather forecast closely, because the markets sure are. If we have a hiccup, you saw what happened with, and I didn't put the soybean up, soybean on up here. This is a two-month move. We went up for about a month, a little over a month and a half, and we took about a, two weeks to come down. Can we rebuild that? Could this thing go up as quickly? Yes, it could, but it's going to need a weather scare. My moral is, if you see a weather scare happening in corn, you better be aggressive in selling your malt barley too. 
At least clean out 15. Now, it won't happen immediately. There's going to be a delay. There's going to be a lag. So when you see corn prices going, it'll be about, usually it's about a one to two weeks you'll start to see malt barley come up. The malt barley market has to be convinced that this is real before it'll follow corn up. So there is a delay. Okay? And with that, I am done.